the title of my message this morning is Bulldog Tenacity in Prayer. Look at the person next to you and say Bulldog Tenacity in Prayer. Yes, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're not only talking about prayer, but we're talking about a bulldog tenacity in the whole arena of prayer. Now, something happened in the 16th century. A group of people decided that they basically wanted to start this whole thing called bull baiting. And what happened is they, they basically, dis they started it off as a, as a sport, okay? And they decided to breed a particular type of dog, all right? And the purpose of this dog was basically so it could bull bait. And so it was also believed, listen to this, it was also believed during that time that bulls were thought to taste better if they were baited before being butchered. Can you believe this? So they thought, well, before you, bu before you actually uh, butcher a bull, it, is, it tastes better if it's been baited. So they decided to, to actually breed a particular type of dog that would be involved in this. But it had to have certain characteristics. It had to have a certain shape. It had to uh, assume a certain demeanor. How many of you actually own a bulldog? No? Okay, all right. How many of you have seen a bulldog? How many of you would like to own a bulldog? Now, what's the interesting feature about bulldogs? What's the one thing that you remember about bulldogs? They're not exactly good looking, okay? I'm not a big fan of dogs, but if I were to choose a dog, I'd probably go for a Maltese poodle. I think it looks cute. Or maybe even in our session, I think it looks a lot better than a bulldog. So what they did was, in the breeding process, they made sure that the face of a bulldog was smashed in. And the reason why it was smashed in is so that when it would bite the bull, it would still be able to breathe. So next time you see a bulldog, just remember that. So they made sure that as they crossbred and, and, and bred this particular dog, which became known as a bulldog, that the face itself was in such a manner that when it actually bit a bull, the, the dog itself would be able to hold on for as long as it needed to whilst being able to breathe. And hence, the face was smashed in. But not only that, they also made sure and decided that the kind of dog they wanted to breed for this particular purpose, that it would be the kind of dog that was low and closer to the ground. And the reason why they ensured that this would be was so that when it fought against the bull, it would make, they would make sure that the bull itself would not be entangled within the horns of the bull. Hey, they put some detail in this, didn't they? But not only that, if you look or remember how a bulldog looks, it's got wrinkles, right? And the purpose in the breeding pr uh, process of ensuring that it had wrinkles was so that when, it were, when the bull itself was bleeding and the blood would come upon the dog, then it would actually drip off quite easily without getting into the eyes and the nose of the dog. More detail. Then they also ensured that the rear part of the bulldog itself was quite short so that if it was flung off the nose of the bull, then the damage itself would not be considerable. And so this is what they actually did for this particular purpose, for this particular bull baiting process, which in the 16th century and thereafter became quite a sport. Now, I don't know. You've probably been in a place where you've come to yourself and said, well, Lord, I have prayed every prayer under the sun, but I'm not seeing answers. How many of you have asked God that question? How many of you have said to yourself, you know what? I've actually received prophecies. I actually have a whole file of prophecies. I have so many words that I've received, but I don't see them coming to fruition yet. How many of you are in that place? 
How many of you are in that place where you look at your friends, your colleagues, your family, and they seem to have fulfilled prayers. They seem to have answered prayers, but you look at your life and say, Lord, I don't know what's happening to me. Why is it that I pray, Lord? I pray without ceasing. I pray all the time, but I just don't see the answers. What am I doing wrong? What should I be doing differently? Or maybe you're even coming to that place where you're saying, you know what? My faith is actually being tested. I don't even know if I believe in the Lord to the extent that I should. I don't even know if I should hold on or there's a reason to hold on. But this morning, I want us to take, the, to take us through a process of understanding what it means to have a bulldog tenacity. You see, the thing about a bulldog is that when it bites, it holds on. It actually holds on for as long as it needs to. It does not let go. And my prayer this morning is that we will be those when we come before God in prayer, when we come before God in the circumstances of our lives, that we will be those who bite and will hold on to the promises of God for our lives without letting go, without being suffocated by the words or the trials of the world out there, without being discouraged, without being in entangled within the horns of the enemy. I want to tell you and I want to remind you this morning that when the enemy comes against you, he's actually coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he's determined to make sure that you will thwart every purpose, every word that God has given you. But I want us to come to that place where we rise from within, where we rise in our minds, where we say to the Lord, expand our inner capacity to contain you in prayer, where we say to the Lord, take us to that place where we can move in revelation of what it means to actually hold on and not give up and be relentless when we pray and come before him in prayer. Amen. So the question is, how do we develop bulldog tenacity in our prayers? What are the key pillars? And that's what we're going to be looking for. The first quality in developing bulldog tenacity in prayer is that bulldog tenacity is about holding on or grasping to something firmly. So in other words, you hold on. You grasp in prayer. You grasp the word of God. You grasp the, pro the promise itself. And you do not let go until you see it come to fruition. I'm reminded of the story of a certain billionaire in Africa. Actually, this guy is a Christian, a mighty, a mighty man of God. And he, he, he's, he's, he's one of the top billionaires in Africa and is also um, on the list of the Forbes billionaires. You know, when I, I was reading this, you know, I was thinking, yeah, maybe one day, you know, somebody will say that of me. How many of you would want to appear on the Forbes list of billionaires? Come on now, where's your faith, hey? Come on now, where's your faith? I don't want this story of talking about other people. I don't want the story of talking about others, other people's testimony. I want to be the people, I want to be the person who's actually on that list. So anyway, this guy, one of Africa's billionaires, and also appears on the Forbes uh, list of billionaires, he basically decided, he really felt strongly that God had called him to establish a mobile phone network business in his country of residence. Okay, And he went to his pastors, he went to his close friends and family, and he basically said, you know what, this is what God has placed in, on my heart. And his uh, background was basically engineering, and he had worked in a telecom setup. But the Lord spoke to him clearly and said to him, it is time for you to actually establish a mobile phone network in your country of residence. How many of you know it's one thing for God to give you a word? It's one thing for you to believe the word that God has given you. It's another to actually face the obstacles that may actually come up with as far as that word is concerned. What he didn't know was that it was going to take a while for him to be granted the license to operate this particular business in that country. Basically, the government of that nation would not grant him the license to operate. 
And so what it transpired was that it became a protracted legal battle that lasted five years. How many of you are in a place or willing to receive the word of God for your life? And then for the next five years, nothing to that effect shows up. Not even one sign. The government basically told them it's not going to happen because it had never been seen. It was new in this particular country. And so he decided, well, you know what? I am so sure God gave me this word. I am so sure this is what God wants to do in this country. If these people are not going to grant me the license, then I'm going to pray until this thing comes into being. So he started a whole pr process of praying, of warring according to the word of God. You know, Paul says to Timothy, war according to the word that you have received. For some of you, I just want to remind you, there are prophecies that you've been given that are hiding somewhere in your shelves or in your, in your Bible somewhere or even in your heart. You've since forgotten about them because when you look at the circumstances around you, you think, well, maybe this is not going to happen. Maybe not me, Lord. Maybe, maybe, maybe another person. I don't have the resources. I don't have the support. But I want to encourage you this morning and say, if you know, like you know that it's the word of God, I want to encourage you to be that person who rises up and say, you know, like Paul said to Timothy, I'm going to rise up and war according to that prophecy. So he started praying. He started praying in his church. They started praying with his friends, with his family. They started praying that this license would be granted. After five years, it was eventually granted. But I remember being told that even during the time of the launch of that mobile uh, phone network, they basically, his wife would literally move around the city, laying hands on every poster, on every street pole that had their advertising collateral. And he would prophesy and speak basically into all that advertising collateral, calling forth the promises of God, calling forth the word of God, speaking the purpose of God for that company, speaking the purposes of God for that nation. You see, bulldog tenacity is not about believing what you see. Bulldog tenacity is the kind of faith, is the kind of a zeal and energy that relies on what God has said and nothing else. So basically, Long story short, it actually became the largest mobile phone uh, network in that country, even up to today. And as if that was not enough, same company, same group, decided to venture into other parts of Africa. They specifically decided to venture into an economy in, um, in, in West Africa. And what happened in that economy, in, the, in, that, in their particular business, is they, unfortunately, yet again, they went into a shareholder dispute when they were um, purchasing uh, a network, a, a mobile network um, company. And what happened in this nation is they were basically told that if you want to be part of this shareholding, you got to offer us a, bri a bribe in the form of this much millions. Millions in terms of a bribe. So the guy was like, no, 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 I don't do that. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to do that. And so he basically said, guys, I'm not going to pay that bribe. And the guys were like, okay, you're not going to pay that bribe. He says, no, I'm not. And God is going to honor my integrity. And then in the board meeting, you know what they told him? They told him, your God has no vote in this board. Your God has no vote in this board. Yet another obstacle. And as I was thinking about it, imagine how many people have come to you and told you, you know what, you can do whatever you want. If you don't do this thing our way, it's not going to happen. In their eyes, it might not happen. In their eyes, they may not see the breakthrough but when we stand in integrity and allow God to do his thing on our behalf and allow God to fight and move on our behalf, then it becomes his battle and not ours. So long story short, they were booted out of that shareholding. But what they didn't know was that a couple of years later, God would open another door in that very nation in the media industry. And that's what they're also doing in that nation, big business. 
And when I see and you know, read and think about these stories, you know, I'm reminded that, you know what, life in prayer is about holding on. You fight, you fight through it. You fight with the sweat. You fight in the, in the bleeding. You shake off the bleeding like a bulldog would. You shake it off until the promises of God have been fulfilled. So bulldog tenacity in prayer is about holding on, grasping firmly to what you believe God has laid on your heart. You hang in there against the voices and opposition of man. Do you know that some of the greatest opposition you face in your walk with God is from the people who love you? It's from the people who are close to you. They'll look at you. You know, there's this term that familiarity breeds contempt. They'll look at you and say, you know, we grew up with you. We know you are went to school with you. Hey, I'm your colleague. You know, we're in the same remuneration bracket. I know what you earn. You know, so what do you mean that you want to now start this business? What do you mean that you can now do this? Some of the greatest opposition you will receive when trying to fulfill what God has promised you, when trying to fulfill the purposes of God in your life, will actually come from those who are very close to you. And my question to you is to what extent are you going to fight? You see, the fact of the matter is it may take a battle to procure even what God has said is yours. Sometimes we think fighting is about things that our God hasn't spoken to us about. It actually may take a battle, it may take warfare for you to procure what God has already said is yours. Ask the Israelites, they will tell you. Ask Joshua, he will tell you. Well, maybe not now, like at 1034, you know, he's enjoying himself in heaven. But the fact of the matter is when you look at the Bible, this is what these guys went through. Did God give them the promised land? Yes. Did God encourage them to march into the promised land? Yes. Was it a walk in the park? Do you know that for the Israelites, for Joshua and the Israelites, for them to actually have peace and fully occupy every aspect of the promised land, do you know that they had to fight seven types of enemies? They had to fight the Hittites. They had to fight the Hivites. And remember, each type of enemy had a special skill, you know, that they used against these Israelites. So they had to fight the Hittites, they had to fight the, the, the Hivites, they had to fight the Gigashites, they had to fight the Amorites, they had to fight the Jebusites, they had to fight the, the Kenites, they had to fight the Perizzites. Now I don't know what your Zites or your sites are this morning, but let me promise you, let me just say this, just like the Israelites, the very thing that God may tell you to move into will not necessarily and might not necessarily be a walk in the park. There are battles that have to be fought even for those things that God has already said is yours. And that is why even when Christ, as, as Pastor Stuart was telling us, the benefits of what Christ has achieved for us on the cross, even those very benefits, whether it's prosperity, whether it's walking in the fullness of our health, we still have to fight and claim them and appropriate them in our daily lives. I like what it says in Hebrew 10 verse 23, let us hold tightly tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise this is what it says in the NLT hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise how many of you believe that God can be trusted to keep his promise how many of you are saying to yourselves this morning that I want to be that person? I want to be that kind of a prayer warrior. I want to be that kind when I'm in my prayer closet that the devil will know that once I hold tightly to a promise of God, it's a done deal. And that's my prayer for us this morning. In Psalm 17 verse 6, David says, I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. 
I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. I like that because what it does is it shows the confidence that David himself had in God. And sometimes, you see, our greatest tragedies sometimes is that when we come before God, we're not even confident that he's going to do this. And yet we know that the Bible says without faith it is impossible to, get, to please God. So it says, I'll call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. I want to pray. You know, I want to encourage us this morning. And my prayer for us as a church, as a community, is that we will be those who will approach God confidently before his throne and say, you will answer us. You are the God who will answer us. And you are the God who will hear us when we pray. In 1 Kings 18, it talks about Elijah. In verse 18, it says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. And we know the background to this story, that basically there had not been rain for about three and a half year, years in Israel. And this time, then God said to Elijah, go present yourself to the king who was Ab, and I will send rain on the earth. And then we look at it again in verse 41. Then Elijah said to Ab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. For there is the sound of abundance of rain. At this stage, when Elijah was speaking to Ab, it wasn't raining. At this time, when Elijah was speaking to Ahab, it was probably just like what we see outside. There was not even one cloud up in the sky. At this side, at this time, there was no sign that the rain was coming. But Elijah, believing the word of God, basically says to, El to Ahab, go up for there's the sound of abundance of rain. You know, sometimes for the fulfillment of God's word for your life, you've got to hear the sound first in the spirit. You gotta see this happening first in the spirit before you can download it in the natural. You gotta believe it and see it with your spiritual eyes. That's why Elisha play, prays for his servant and basically says when they are surrounded by the enemies, he basically says, Lord, open his eyes so he can see that those around us are many, those with us are many than those around us. Sometimes to capture the promises of God, to walk in bulldog tenacity in prayer, it begins with seeing and hearing what's in the spirit first. So he says to Ab, you know what? You better go eat and drink for this, the sound of the abundance of rain. So Ab went up to, to eat and drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up, look toward the sea. For so you went up and looked. There is nothing. And seven times he said, go again. Seven times he said, go again. Holding on, biting onto the promise, not letting go. God, you said it would happen. You said it's going to rain now after three and a half years. This servant of mine is coming back and telling me there's nothing. There's not even one sight or, 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 or proof that it's going to rain seven times. Kept on saying, go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising up to the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. There are things that we only going to birth in our lives only and only when we trust and don't give up in our prayers. That's the kind of heart, that's the kind of faith and tenacity we need to hold as we pray through our circumstances. And so you hear, and I've asked some of these questions, you know, where you say, you know, but why is it that it's taking long? My prayers are not being answered. Do you know, or could it be that sometimes God is interested in building your character more than in your breakthrough? more than in giving you an instant breakthrough. 
You see, the thing is sometimes God looks at us, looks on the inside of us. God knows for which purpose he's called us to. So what he needs to do from time to time is he needs to make sure that we've been equipped. Our muscles are flexed to such an extent that we can carry through the promises of God for our lives. And so sometimes God is more interested in building your character than in just bringing about your breakthrough. Could it be that sometimes God would rather train your hands for war and your fingers for battle rather than giving you an immediate victory? You see, it's all good to receive an immediate victory or quick answers to prayer all the time. But to what good would that be if your character is not molded, if your hands are not trained for war and your fingers for, um, for battle? My question to you this morning is, are you prepared to bite tightly and hold on to prayer until God is done with you and the burden is lifted? And this is a decision that you will have to make on an individual basis. Not your hubby is not gonna do that for you, not your mom, not your dad, not your boss. Are you prepared to buy tightly and hold on to prayer until God is done with you and the burden has been lifted? So one of the pillars in terms of building tenacity in prayer is holding on and grasping to that which God has promised you firmly. The second thing is that bulldog tenacity in prayer is about the ferocity and bravery to protect what is within your turf, not just for you, but for the next generation. So it's the ferocity and bravery to protect what is within your turf, not just for you, but for the next generation too. And so what that means is that when the devil comes and messes up with your children, He's actually picking a personal battle, a personal fight with you. When the devil comes into your family and starts messing around with your marriage, he's basically literally picking a personal fight with you. When the devil steals your health, then it's about time you roll up your sleeves and wage war against him. Sometimes God is not in a hurry to answer our prayer because what he's doing is he's actually developing in us or he's actually wanting to invest in us those things that he wants us to impart to the next generation. It's one thing to want to impart certain things and principles of God to the next generation, but how many of you know you cannot impart what you don't have? You cannot impart effectively what you haven't experienced. You cannot impart effectively what you don't have a revelation of. Some of the reason why the prayers you have been praying may not have been answered today is simply because God still wants to invest something in you so that you can impart it to the next generation. I like what it says in Psalm 78 here. From verse 5, this is a psalm written by a guy called Asaph. Often we think, oh yeah, it's David who wrote all the psalms. You know, there's a guy, a brother called Asaph. And so he says, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel when he commanded our fathers, when he commanded our fathers that they should make known to their children that the generation to come may know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare to them the hope, their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. You see, the thing is, God is a multi-generational God. He thinks in generations. That's why the Bible makes it clear that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm reminded of the story of, Dave, of, of David and Goliath. Do you know, and most of you would agree with me, that Goliath should not have been and was not supposed to be David's problem. We know the story. David is asked to take resources to his brother. He wasn't even in the army that was being threatened by Goliath. But what happened was that Saul, who was the king, and that whole generation of the army were too timid to approach the very enemy of their generation. 
And so often what happens is that the very things we don't pray against, the very things we don't fight, the very things we don't war against in our generation, if we're not careful, will become the problems of our children, will become the problems of our next generation. I want to encourage you, if you know that there are issues in your life or family or curses that you face as a family, I want to encourage you to be that person in the family who will say enough, enough is enough. The buck stops right here. I'm going to fight against this curse that blows, flows into our, fl in our, into our fl bloodline so that my children will not have to deal with this or fight this. If Saul and the army had fought Goliath, David would not have to. There are certain prayers and there's a tenacity we need to have in prayer so that we conquer in this generation things that should not affect our children, things that should not affect the next generation. I don't know about you, but I don't know, you know, when it comes to me, I was thinking about this and saying, Lord, if there are battles that I can fight today so that my children in the next generation won't have to, then I want to be that person who will stand up and say, give me that kind of tenacity that will do that for, that will do that for you and for your kingdom. I was speaking to somebody very close to me, and basically what's happening is that they're going, they're going through divorce. And, and it's, it's, it's a traumatic experience and, you know, just from sharing with them and, and interacting with them, it's not anything I'd wish on, on, on anybody. And some of you, you know what I'm talking about. You've, you know, you know people have gone through this or you've been affected in one way or the other. And so I remember praying with this person and at some stage she said, she said to me, you know what, Vim, I think... I'm giving up, I'm done, I don't want to pray into this anymore. And then I said, here's the thing. The fact of the matter is concerning this particular couple that's considering divorce is that there's actually a flaw and a curse of divorce in their family line. You see it from their parents, you see it in their siblings, you see it in their lives. And so I said to her, you know what? I don't know what the outcome of your situation is, but for all that, that it's worth, I want to encourage you, if there's going to be any motivation for you to pray and uproot this thing from your bloodline and your family, do it for your children. Do it for your children. There are some burdens in prayer that God will give you that might not be of, necess of, of, of necessary immediate benefit to you, but you do them either for your children or you do them for your family or you do them for your, or your, for your city, for your nation or for your business. And so I say to, to her, for what it's worth, are you willing to fight this thing and uproot it for the sake of your children's marriages? You see, bulldog tenacity in prayer is critical in guarding even that which belongs to the, next, to the next generation. So I want to encourage you, when you call to prayer, to pray into certain things, you know, they might look like, well, you know what, they're for me, you know, but also ask God to what extent will victory in this area affect my children or the next generation. My question to you is, have you aborted certain prayers that you may need to go back to, pick up, and pursue them in faith. I want to encourage you to ask God when you go back home and say, Lord, what are the things you've wanted me to pray into and fight for breakthrough that I've aborted? Do you understand the impact and importance of your prayers to the next generation? A question to answer. The third pillar is that bulldog tenacity in prayer is about persistence, determination, and stubbornness to pursue what you believe the Holy Spirit is leading you to. It's about persistence, it's about determination, and it's about stubbornness. There's no other scripture, you know, that talks about persistence like Luke 18 from verse 1. It says, when Jesus told then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. You would agree with me 
often when you read the parables that Jesus told, you don't get this type of opening sentence. You kind of like read the Bible, I mean the parable in, you know, midway you're trying to figure out what Jesus is saying. But this is one of the parables, if not the only parable, where Jesus said, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not giving up. Not giving up is a biblical principle. How many of you are, agree with me? Not giving up is a biblical principle. He said in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, some of you, you pray into an issue once or twice and the third time you're like, hey, I'm done. I mean, I don't want to go to God again, you know, because you'll be there, you know, I'll be there. I come, I rock up into his presence. It's like angels see, there she goes again. But here the judge says, because this widow keeps bothering you. How many of you have kept bothering God in your prayers? How many of you have said, God, you know what, I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to keep coming. This thing is close to my heart. I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, he will find, will he find faith on the earth? Some of you will know the story of Kenneth Hagen. And basically what happened is that he was, he was born with a deformed heart. He was born with a deformed heart and also an incurable blood disease. I mean, who would have ever thought of that? And when he was about 15, he became completely paralyzed, completely paralyzed, confined to bed, and he was told that you're not going to live. In April 1933, Hagen said, his heart stopped beating, and his other vital signs failed three times. In these three instances, Hagen said he felt himself being dragged into hell. In the third instance, he prayed for Christ's help and forgiveness and became back to life. It was this very miracle that would define the rest of this, of his life. There are some things you are pushing for and warring for in prayer that's until and if you don't give up might just be the defining moment of your destiny and, the, and your purpose. And so basically what happened after that miracle is he took, this became, this particular verse became one of his life verses. This is Mark 11 verse 24. It says, therefore I say to you, Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And we know the rest of his story. He became known as the father of faith. And this is what he said. Sometimes, I quote, sometimes you just have to get forceful about it and have the tenacity of a bulldog. Grab hold of God's word and don't ever turn loose. And he goes on to say that there was a season in his life when the devil said, now you've got all these symptoms and you're going to die, just like the doctor said. There isn't anything that medical science can do here. They've already told you that. So there's no use to look to medical science. You're going to die. And his response to the devil was say, he basically said, devil, the Bible said, he took my infirmities and, bear, and bore my sickness. I don't care what the symptoms are. I don't care how I feel or how I look. According to the word of God, I believe that I'm healed. And then he literally put his Bible down on the floor and stood on it. Okay? I mean, 
and stood on it. I suppose it works better without heels. You know, I'm sure you, you know, you would have had flat shoes. And then he said, what I did was I put my Bible down on the floor and stood on it. I said, God, to illustrate a spiritual fact, I am standing on your word. You know, the fact of the matter is sometimes you actually have to actually, you know, t have a showdown with the enemy. And so he knows God had actually healed him. And now the enemy is now trying to bring a contrary report. And he says, if this is your word, if this is your word, I'm going to stand on it. I'm going to believe what it says. I'm going to pray and make sure that its promises that it has for my, for my health are going to come to fruition. And sometimes that is the kind of desperation we actually have to arrive at. Sometimes we are so prone to the devil's voice, you know, and the voice, the voice of the enemy, the report of the enemy, that we nullify what God says of his word. Isn't that encouraging? You was not expected to die, to, to live as a teenager, and he died at 86. Throughout his life, at 15, he was told, you're going to die. You could have believed that report, but he decided throughout his life to stand on God's word and war with bulldog tenacity. He says it with his, he said it with his own words that sometimes, he actually used the word violent, he says sometimes you actually have to be violent and forceful about your breakthrough. To what extent are you forceful about your breakthrough? Or you're like, oh well, it's been said, you know, there's no, there's no need for me to continue. God does not begrudge answering prayer. Jesus points us, basically in this parable of the widow, Jesus' point is that if an insensitive judge will respond to the continual requests of a widow, then to what extent will God himself respond to our requests? And what's interesting about this parable is that Jesus seems to suggest that the outcome, that God's will can be swayed by persistent prayer. And I find that encouraging in itself. So what happens in the face of delayed response or unanswered prayer? The first thing we need to understand is that we need to have a proper view of God. And that view includes that knowing and understanding that God cares for you. In Psalm 103, it says, Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. How many of you fear God? We need to understand that. Yeah, I, and here's the thing. Here's the principle. You will not always be in a position where you will understand why your answers to your prayers are delayed or why they're not being answered at all. But the important thing is, when you align yourself to the word of God, it is important that we have a correct view in that season, in those circumstances of God. And one of that is that he's a God who cares for us. In Psalm 49, verse 14, it says, The Lord has, Zion has said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget a nursing child and have no compassion on the womb of a child? Even when he, she forgets, I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. We also need to understand that when God delays in responding to our prayers, it is not because of a lack of power. The Bible makes it clear to us that God is all-powerful. And so when he delays, it is not to say that it's because of a lack of power. The fact of the matter is that God is a God who's seated on the throne. And God will not desert his post. I know like in the army, you know, it's a, they're very big on, you know, if you desert your post, you will be disciplined. God is a God you can count on. God is a God who's still on duty. And he is not and will not desert his, um, his post. We also need to remember that even in the face of delayed response, God is still our best bet. I remember a friend of mine a few weeks ago saying to me, Vim, why are you still believing God for this? And then I said, you know what? I actually don't have an option. Even in, the, in, the, in, in situations and circumstances where I don't see the light, God is still my best bet. What other option would I have? 
What other hope is there to hang on to? What other reason is there to live for? And so even in the face of delayed response, God is still our best, our best bet. We need to also have a proper view of ourselves that we can trust God because we know that he, we are his elect. That often he has a bigger picture than what we see. You see, when we're going through trials and difficult situations in our lives, the temptation is that we only see what's happening or what you can see in the short term. But God often has a bigger picture that sometimes our eyes and our faith cannot reach out to. So my question to you is, to what degree are you persistent, determined, stubborn in your prayers to pursue what you believe God has spoken to you about? The fourth pillar is that bulldog tenacity means to stick with something even when the going gets tough. Hmm? Psalm 33 says, for the word of God is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. I was reading the story of a guy who was very instrumental in the Pentecostal revival in Africa. And this is in the early century. I think he was born in 19, 1904. And he was mightily used by God. In fact, what happened was there was a time when he was praying and the Lord appeared to him. He saw a vision of, of, of the Lord. And basically, God said to him, I want you from now on, when you move evangelizing from one city to another in, your, in, in, that, part of, in that part of Africa, I want you to carry a bell. Like literally a bell. You know, the last time I saw a bell was in school. And I went to school where, you know, we didn't have electric bells at the time, you know. So you had this head prefect who actually had to... And so basically God said to him, when you go and minister, it was an, a mightily used, you know, in healings, in, in um, uh, raising the dead, those kind of miracles. I want you to carry this bell around. And so what would happen was you would go into an area and start ministering. And what would happen was that the moment you would ring the bell, angels would literally be released in the place. And I read this and I was like, man, maybe I should by faith just buy a bell, hey? I go, hey, you walk into an interview, hey, whilst they're getting ready, you kind of like just, hey, you, you, you're just shaking that thing. You're just shaking that thing, hey? You walk into a crucial meeting that is just about to decide your destiny. You're like, let me just go to the bathroom. You start shaking your bell and angels, angelic hosts are released. And this is what would happen with this guy. Angels would actually be released into his, into his meetings and people would be released. There was a time when you went to, to different cities and hospitals in those particular cities were shut down. They had no need for them. People were healed. In, that, in, the, in, that partic in those particular cities, they would come to him, be prayed for, and it's all over. So hospitals were like, hey, you know, you know, and I'm thinking if that were to happen in our nation, you know what would that would do to our budget? You know what that would do to our fiscus? You know, and so this guy mightly used of God, but his life was not without obstacles or without opposition. He was jailed in some season and period in his life for about six months for basically preaching against evil spirits in that particular area. He was jailed for six months. It wasn't easy. You see, the thing with bulldog tenacity is about being determined, persistent, and stubborn, knowing that, you know what, they can put me in jail, but God has given me an anointing to preach his word. God has given me an anointing to bring healing to those who need it. God has given me an anointing to preach his word mightily. So yes, they might put me behind bars, but I ain't going to stop doing that. And so even when he went out of, when they finally got him out of prison, he still continued being used mightily. It is also said of him that when, you know, on a day that he didn't pray much, it was usually three or four hours. He's reported sometimes to go for seven days of prayer with nonstop. I'm like, you know, maybe I, no, I don't have that grace. I don't, just don't have that grace. You know, my employer would have serious issues with me, you know, if I prayed continuously seven days and not rock up to work. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is when you know what God has placed in your life, the calling upon your life, and you're motivated 
to persist and you're determined and stubborn to ensure that those particular purposes come into, into being. I just want to conclude with a, with a couple of things. I'm going to read out the ex an, an extract from a, a, these are lyrics from a, a, a particular song from a, a movie that was quite famous. All right, some of you will recognize it, but if you do, then it's going to show me, tell me how old you are. Okay. <laughs> you were born a fighter, driven by desire. Glory calls that's waiting for you. When they try to break you down, you can take it. They don't shake you. When your back's against the wall, the thrill of the fights got you standing tall. Never surrender. Never say die. You've got the heart of a hero. Never surrender. The will to survive. You standing strong in the eye of a storm. Something keeps pushing you on. To never surrender. To never surrender. Winners have a price to pay. You're not there to take the fall. You'll fight till the end and you take it all. Never surrender, never say die. You've got the heart of a hero. Never surrender, never surrender, never say die. Don't stop. Never surrender. You've got the will to survive. Never surrender. Might be a, sec uh, a secular song, but you know what? There's some truths in those lyrics. You know, when I was reading them and I was thinking, that's what I want to be known for. I don't want you to know me for the accent in my voice or the color of the car I drive. I want to be known as somebody who never surrenders in the face of opposition from the devil. I want to be known in the territory of the enemy that when I open my mouth and begin to pull down strongholds and begin to uphold demonic strongholds against my life or situations, the devil will shudder in his territory. I want to be the kind of person, you know, when I take hold of the promises of God, I will war according to them. I will bite like a bulldog would. I will persist and be determined and hang on until that which God has said should be fulfilled will be fulfilled. I don't know how long I've got to live, but I know that if I hold on, if I step, if I believe in the word of God, God will honor that and something will happen in my life. Prime Minister Winston Churchill's address to Harrow School on October 29, 1941. Never give in. Never give in. Never. 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 Obviously he had a British accent. Never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in, except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. My brothers and sisters, is the fact of the matter is the enemy will come against you with all his might. But I want to encourage you to never, never, never give in. In another address to the House of Commons, June 4, 1940, he said the following, we shall go to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streams. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. What this morning? Are you going to tell yourself when you look at your life, when you look at what you believe in God, are you going to say, and, and are you going to stop and say, for this I shall fight, for this very thing I shall fight. And when I read about this and how some of these speeches just inspired many people and are still being talked about today, I made a decision and I decided to write my life's never surrender speech. I crafted this on the 1st of September 2018. And for the first time, it's being delivered to a public audience. Go Christian Church Centurion on September 2, 2018. Maybe they'll say this about me someday, you know, in some century. And this is how my speech would read. My journey as a believer has been met with victories and other times setbacks. And these setbacks, some of which I've had a part to play in bringing them into being, others have been out of my control. There have been mountains to climb and bruises sustained as I go up the inclines of life. 
valleys to navigate. The storms of my life have sought to plunder my every victory. The seas of my circumstances have been determined to silence my hope. The winds of discouragement have howled through my ears, bringing a contrary report to the word of God. There have been questions, some of which I received answers, but others remain unanswered. Yes, there are times when my faith has been challenged and my prayers seem unanswered. But I am reminded that I will pass, when I pass through the waters, God is with me. And through the rivers, they will not overflow me. When I walk through the fire, I will not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch me. That even though weeping may endure for a night, but joy shall surely come in the morning. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines. Though the labor of the olive may fail, and the yield, fields yield no food. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. My God was mightier than the noise of many waters, than the noise of the waters I've experienced in my life, mightier than the waves of the sea. His testimonies are very sure. I will pray without ceasing. I will fight the good faith and lay hold of eternal, eternal life and profess the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Because I know that if I remain strong, if I don't give up, if I bite, if I allow God to build bulldog tenacity in me in prayer, I will be strong and carry out great exploits in him. Bulldog tenacity, my friends, my brothers and sisters, is anchored in the fact that we pray to an infinite, to an immutable, to a never-changing, self-sufficient God whose word is eternal, whose word is infallible, inspired, dynamic, powerful, quick, sharp, and is a discerner of the hearts of men. I want to encourage you this morning to never let go of what you're believing God for. And my challenge to you in the next couple of days or weeks or months is I want to challenge you to craft your own life's never surrender speech because one day you're going to need it. One day you're going to need to pull it out when life doesn't make sense, when defeat seems like that's all that's around you. You're going to need to pull it out and read it and encourage yourself. Let's stand as we make these declarations. I'm going to call out a couple of declarations, and then the rest, they're actually going to form our prayer strategy for this week, so you can continue into, into the week. All right. So I'm going to make this de these declarations over us, and then you're going to agree, or if you agree, all right, with an amen. Amen. All right. I declare and decree a double portion of tenacity, determination, patience, and strength over you as you wait for the fulfillment of God's word over your life in the name of Jesus. Amen. I declare and decree that you will not surrender or abort your prayers before you receive your breakthrough. Amen. I declare and decree that your prayer life will move from glory to glory in the name of Jesus. I declare and decree that your prayers will impact both the spiritual and the natural realms in the name of Jesus. Amen. I declare and decree that you'll find strength in God as you wait on him in all areas of God and prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. I declare and decree that the Lord your God will arise for your sake in the name of Jesus. I declare and decree that God will restore your wasted years in the name of Jesus. Amen. I declare and decree that God will accelerate your journey and your breakthroughs in the name of Jesus. Amen. I declare and decree that everything you touch will prosper in the name of Jesus. Amen. I declare and decree that everything, that windows of great opportunities will open in your life in the name of Jesus. Amen. I declare and decree that you shall overtake your problems in the name of Jesus. I declare and decree that God will reform your losses and bind your wounds in the name of Jesus. 
I declare and decree that you will experience a marathon of favor in your life in the name of Jesus. I declare and decree that you will receive favor from unexpected places in the name of Jesus. I declare and decree that the Lord will sweep you into great breakthroughs in the name of Jesus. I declare and decree that you will jump out of the pit of poverty into the arena of prosperity in the name of Jesus. I declare and decree that you will fly from the sky of rejection into the firmament of dominion in the name of Jesus. I declare and decree that you will cross over to the arena of victory in the name of Jesus. I declare and decree that you will depart from the bus stop of stagnancy to the arena of breakthroughs. Amen. I declare and decree that your miracle will give birth to other miracles in the name of Jesus. Amen. I declare and decree that your impossibility shall become possible in the name of Jesus. Amen. I declare and decree, this is the final one, that your destiny shall attract color in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.